Hello and welcome to ATP Report. I'm Barry Nussbaum. Our very special guest today is Dr. Bill Warner. He's obviously a good friend of American Truth Project, and he's the founder of the Center for Political Islam International. Dr. Bill is the author of a lot of books and articles, and he is a specialist and scholar on Islam. He's a college professor, an educator, and our friend. Welcome, Dr. Bill. Glad to be here, Barry. So today, we're going to talk about Islam, and we're going to talk about freedom of expression and freedom of the press as it relates to that subject. So let's start with, well, the golden rule. You know, the one where it says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, as you've called it. It's the ethical foundation of Western civilization. Critical thought, the intellectual foundation of our civilization, is based on the ability to examine and discuss an idea. As you've said, there's no critical thought without freedom of speech. And without freedom of speech, there's no freedom of the press and probably not freedom of religion. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first off, they're the, they're our most precious freedoms. The freedom to speak what we want to say, free, the freedom to believe what we want to believe. But we have a, that's, our freedom of speech plays into critical thought. And critical thought is the foundation of our civilization. But there's also the golden rule, which you had mentioned. Now these two interact with each other and they allow us to have a constitution which is adaptive. For instance, I happen to be a man. And when the Constitution was written, I would have been able to vote if I owned property. But as time went on, it became less and less obvious to anybody as to why women should not be able to vote as well. I mean, if I were a woman, I'd want to vote. So here we have the golden rule aspect cutting in. Would I want to be cut out of voting just because I'm a woman? No. And you, so it also, once you start thinking about it, it doesn't even make any good sense. So these two ethical principles interact with each other and give us a flexibility. And if we lose them, we've lost our foundations of our civilization. And Barry, that's, I'm much concerned about this. I don't mean to be, you know, worry wart, but I see, when, when Facebook sets up a hate speech engineering team, I'm like, you know what? Who would they censor? Well, I'd be one of the first. Yeah, and I'd be right behind you. So freedom of speech includes the ability to be critical of others and to express hate speech, more or less. So I looked it up in the dictionary and the best definition I found for hate speech is public speech that expresses hate or encourages violence towards a person or a group based on something such as race, religion, sex, or sexual orientation. So hate speech is usually thought to include communications of animosity, disparagement of an individual or a group based on that group's characteristics. So how did that definition, the one I just read, get to include saying anything negative about Islam? How is that hate speech if you're just reporting the facts? Well, facts have become hate. Once again, the novel 1984 seems to be upon us because, look, we need to discuss difficult issues and we need to discuss all points of the issue. Everybody would like to think that they're the only one who's the smartest man in the room, but the truth of the matter is we all make errors, we all make mistakes, and we need to be able to be corrected on those. And if hate speech includes correcting people and doing things that are ineffective, then hate speech is simply something that retards our civilization. And besides that, well, who defines these groups that can't be hated? For instance, I'm a white Southern male. Let me assure you, Barry, that I'm not on the select list of those who are to be protected. <laughs> I guarantee it. But if you as a scholar quote Islam, you're going to be labeled a purveyor of hate speech. And, and here's my real specific lack of understanding. Islamic sponsored violent speech, especially from imams who openly, in Islamic centers around the world, but let's talk about America, who openly call for violence 
and openly call for murder of Jews and Christians or people that they think have defiled the religion, for some reason, that's okay. But if you report about it and quote what was said, you are a hater. So how did Islam become this protected minority that can say whatever it wants as a group, but if you quote it, you are a hater? I shall strike terror into the heart of the Kafir is one of the uh, phrases we come from the uh, Quran. So basically people are afraid of Islam. When I first started doing this and people found out what I was doing, one of the most common questions was, aren't you afraid? As a matter of fact, that's the reason I did a video one time called Why We Are Afraid, and it traced the history of jihad for over 1,400 years. And the reason I got that title from that, it was something that people said to me, they're afraid of Islam. I, f I find it interesting that one of the professors at Al-Azhar University said that it was the law of apostasy that allowed Islam to exist, because if people could leave if they wanted to, it would cease to exist. So I'm not sure what that's got to do with hate, but I guess if you're a Muslim and you learn to hate Islam, you got to stay with it. You can't leave it. So why is Islam afforded special treatment? Why are Muslims a protected minority in that you can say whatever you want from the pulpit in a Muslim religious center, or you can print horrible things, or you can call for the death of, well, Dr. Bill and Barry. Yep. But if we report about it, and then we quote the scriptures, without even a commentary, we're haters. Why is that a protected minority group with those special circumstances? I'm sorry, I just don't get it. They demand it. And we're, and what we are, and that we're living in a country now in which the demands of the minority are to be honored. And so they demand it. I've spoken with women who were, I spoke with one woman who was the head of National Organization of Women here in Nashville, Tennessee. And I asked her, I says, how can you tolerate as a feminist the business of Sharia violence against women? She says, Bill, I've tried to bring it up at meetings and they immediately shut me down. They will not let me talk about it. I was trying to talk with some Jewish leaders in this town. And one of them who was a very successful businessman and an attorney looked at me and said, you're a member of the KKK for all practical purposes. I don't wanna hear any more about this, you're a hater. And all I was doing was guess what, talking about what Muhammad did with the Jews. I've talked with Christians. Would you ever stand up for the persecuted Christians in the Middle East? They don't say a word. They want to be nice and no one wants to ruffle any feathers. Everybody seems to be suffering from some sort of massive guilt complex. Well, you know, it's really not just Islam anymore. Um, it seems it's just not okay to discuss in critical terms, it, in addition to Islam, race, climate change, gender studies, your disagreement with the COVID virus, lockdowns or lack thereof, Black Lives Matter, it, it is protected speech and protected groups spreading so fast that our First Amendment rights are being shrunk into smaller and smaller boxes? This is true. Here's an example of why we need free speech. I was a professor at a historically black university for eight years. I'm very known for my frankness of speech. One day I was talking with a class and they were talking about something about being, I forget what had happened. Anyway, they were describing themselves as a victim. I said, let me ask you something, gentlemen, because it was mostly a male class. I said, let me explain something to you about being a victim. Listen carefully. A victim is a loser. Why do you want to put yourself in the position of modeling your entire civilization on being a loser? I says, you want to be a winner. And I says, to do that, you need to start positively in your thinking. But I said, if you, all, if you think that I can't succeed because Whitey's going to keep me down, then you're going to do nothing. And you're being controlled. So we need to be uh, able to bring up points that may be unpleasant, but they're true. And my comments were meant to be useful. I wanted my students to succeed, not to figure, well, there's no sense trying. Because as we all know, the first step towards success is deciding you're going to do something. And this victim mentality means you don't do anything because why should you bother to do anything?
Yeah, well, you know, you talked about feminism as an example. I, I'm stunned that women who march in these women marches um, and as a general rule consider a Donald Trump to be the worst thing to ever happen to women's rights in the history of mankind, won't speak out against Sharia treatment of women who, I mean, there's Islamic men around the world killing their women, mutilating their women, selling their women, beating their women to death. And yet, that's not okay to talk about it. Jews, as you mentioned, don't seem to want to speak out against Islamic hatred of Jews. Christians don't want to seem to speak out about Christians being slaughtered, mass murder sense. in Africa and Asia, in the Middle East. Why the silence, Bill? Fear is what I think, because who, who is the German theologian who said silence in the face of evil is evil itself? We become a nation who has become passive. I think we're too soft. When I see injustice, my first instinct is to do something about it. And I don't care what you say about me. I'm going to do it, say it anyway. But other people seem to be very influenced by not being unpopular because they want to do something, but if only if it's nice. Let me tell you something. Nice is okay in small doses, but taken as a steady diet, it produces somebody who's not a strong person. Well, you got that right, Dr. Bill. So I understand you've got a new organization that is intended to educate on this subject. Please tell our listeners about it. Well, I can talk about this because I don't need to take much credit about it, credit about it at all. Some years ago, about six years as a matter of fact, a man by the name of Milan Polipny called from the Czech Republic and said, could we start a center for the study of political Islam in Central Europe? And I said, sure. I never thought anything about it, but it turns out he's an organizational genius. And so over a period of six years, he put together something which we call Center for CSPI International. And what's amazing is, is we're now bringing it to the United States today, this process has started. And it's a very unique thing. We, we're volunteer based, we're a nonprofit educational institution. We translate and publish books, we provide training and lectures on, and do research. So we also have a global connection because he, we think that Islam is a global problem and it demands an international solution. Let's, take, let's imagine for the moment that the United States became totally free of all the problems of Islam, but the rest of the world grew. One day they would close in on us. Islam must be defeated in a global sense, not just in a local town hall meeting. Where can people find out about the organization? Well, if you don't have a pencil at hand, you can contact me at politicalislam.com. But if you have a pencil at hand, it's cspii.org and there's a place there where you can join us and now when you join us it's not like an ordinary organization you're going to need to work and change yourself there's a lot you're going to have to learn but this is only yep. one of two organizations let me add quickly that we have another organization which is not highly structured at all and it's called kafirnet because not everybody wants to become disciplined and learn a lot about islam and what you have to do to be in say cspi international but in this way you can set up and define your own projects, have people you want to work with. And so it's a community, pay, community project page, which we're designing for those who would like to be just purely activist. Got it. Thanks for joining us today, Bill. And thank you for joining us at ATP Report. Remember, if you haven't signed up yet for our free text message alert system, please take out your cell phone now type the word truth in the message box, send it to 88202, 88202, push send. You'll be automatically connected and signed up for our free text message alert system to get this show and all other shows directly to your cell phone. You can always do it on the internet as well by going to americantruthproject.org and signing up there. For ATP Report, I'm Barry Nussbaum. Thank <laughs> you.